Good evening, this is Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education meeting. Thank you all for being here. Um, we had a closed session. First thing I want to say is, ¿Hay alguien aquí que necesita un intérprete para esta junta? Okay. And we have, <coughs> yes. Okay. The Pledge of Allegiance by Elliott School. Good evening, Dr. Flores, school board members, and all of you. Welcome to our very special night. The kids are so excited. It is my pleasure, pleasure to introduce to you Elliot Student Council. Good evening, Dr. Flores and all school board members. My name is Jacqueline Carrillo, and I'm Student Council President for Elliot Elementary. My name is America Juarez, and I am the Student Council Vice President for Alia Elementary. My name is Malia Lopez, and I am Student Council Secretary for Alia Elementary. My name is oh, oh my name is Marlon Flores, and I am also Student Council Secretary for Alia Elementary. My name is Jose Ortiz, and I am student council officer for LDA Elementary. My name is Hazel Quintero, and I am student council officer for LDA Elementary. My name is Mario Lopez, and I am a student council officer for LDA Elementary. My name is Christian Casillas, and I am student council um, I'm a student council officer for Elliott Elementary. My name is Ivan Santos, and I am a student council um, officer for Elliott Elementary. My name is Alexander Rodriguez, and I am a student council officer for Elliott Elementary. Hi, my name is Ava, and I am a student council officer for Elliott Elementary. Let's take a minute of silence to honor the victims at the high school shooting. Can you please stand? Thank you. Can you Thank you. Now will you please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, I would like to thank Principal Patricia Pelino for bringing her students tonight. Thank you. Good job, Elliot. Item 3B is approval of agenda. Move approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And we have recognitions. Let's go, Mr. Dots. Come 
We have a few recognitions this evening, so I'll start with um, our choir students. And I'd last, like to ask that our choir directors come up here. I know I saw Jonathan. Good, great. So Jonathan Sousa is the choir director for Solar Sano and Gilroy High. Kira Dixon is the choir director for South Valley and Christopher High. And is Lori Avey here? No, from Brown Owl. Anyway, we have amazing choir directors in Gilroy Unified. We are just so fortunate to have such talent here. And over, the, over recent years, they've just really developed our choir programs at both high schools. And we're just really proud of both of you. So thank you. So we're going to recognize some students. But with Jonathan's help, I want to tell you a little bit about it first. So he helped with these comments. So, Choir students from our middle and our high schools are being recognized tonight for their outstanding choral achievements and participation in various honor choirs. They've shown choral excellence in their ensembles at their school sites. They, the ad audition requirements for each of these ensembles ranges from teacher recognitions up to rigorous, a very rigorous audition process. The, just to give you an example, the high school students had to prepare an Ita Italian art song, perform various vocal exercises, demonstrate music sight reading skills, and much more. To be selected for any of these ensembles is a great honor, and they represent the very best of Gilroy Unified. Every year, there are students who the choral educators nominate to, to audition for various honor choirs regionally, statewide, and nationally. These students show a high aptitude for music, are often leaders at their schools, and make considerable contributions to our choral ensembles in Gilroy Unified. These young people are not only ready for the highly focused and challenging experience of singing in an honor choir, they're also good citizens, have a strong work ethic, and are singing ambassadors for our program and the larger Gilroy community. This year, a number of students from Gilroy Unified Choral Program made various honor choirs, including the California Music Educators Association Middle School Conference Choir, California Choral Directors Association Regional and State Honor Choir, Western Division American Choral Directors Association Honor Choir, Honor Choir USA, and the Honolulu and World Strides Honors Performance Series Honor Choir at Carnegie, Carnegie Hall. So we're going to recognize these students. And I'm going to start with the middle school students. And I'm going to ask them to come up first, and then I'll pull out the certificate. So from Brownell Middle School, Melody Nguyen. Is that? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you just stand right here? Uh, you know what? I'll do the certificate as we do each. So congratulations, Thank Melody. You. Great job. Thank you. And you can stay right here. We're going to do a picture. <laughs> From Solar Sano Middle School, we have, and by the way, that was for the California Music Educators Association Bay Section Conference Honor Choir. And now we have Solar Sano Middle School, so we have two students, Jonathan Tessman and Brianna Condi for the California Music Educators Association Bay Section Conference Honor Choir. Okay, congratulations, Brianna. We're very proud of you, too. <laughs> and then from South Valley Middle School, um, we have two students that uh, are recognized for the California Music Education, uh, Educators Association Bay Section Conference Honor Choir, and that's Erin Monger and Esmeralda Martinez. Erin? <laughs> Congratulations, great job. Congratulations, great job. Well so these are our middle school honor choir recipients. Let's give them a big hand. Two more. Did I miss? Two more. Oh, there's, hang on, there's two more. I've got different a long, I have a long list here. So this is a different choir. Uh -huh. Western Division America Choral Directors Association Honor Choir. We do have two middle school students. And then one of them also was the California Music Educators Association Bay Section Conference Choir. So Cecilia received those two and Jared the first. So are you here? Great. <laughs> Congratulations.
congratulations, Cecilia. And congratulations, Jared. Great job to all of you. Now let's recognize our middle school. Hey. Jaime Rosso is going to take a picture, and any parents that want to do middle school, you can come up here real quick. Paparazzi, come on up. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you come on out, and I'll get back here. Okay. Oh, okay. I know my daughter. There you go. All right, now we'll recognize our high school um, honorees. And I'm just going to abbreviate this now yeah, that sure. I've said it like five yeah. times. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to do the CMEA uh, Bay Section Conference uh, Honor Choir recipients from Christopher High. So we have Emma Holm, Michael Cruel, and Justin Chavez. Congratulate, Michael, why don't you come, come over here? here. <laughs> Congratulations, great job. And you can stay up here. All right, and then we have three students from Christopher, well, one student from Christopher that received three awards? Yeah. Wow. So the California Choral Directors Association Regional and All-State Honor Choirs and the American Choral Directors Association Regional Honor Choir. So three uh, recognitions for Isif Della Merced. Isif, and he's at rehearsal he's at right rehearsal now. Today. Oh my goodness! Their performance is on Saturday. So oh. like he's, his parents are here though. Great. Yay. You want to? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you their the certificates in a in a second when I finish. But thank you for being here. Okay. Then for Gilroy High, are some of these students also they, they performing should, no, right no, now? They should be here. <laughs> they should be here. <laughs> Okay. Let me see where I am. That was that. That was one. Yeah, there you are. So I'm at Ross. Mm -hmm. I think you have one. I hope. Yeah, that would help. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? Okay. You got it. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So why don't you hand them out I'll as I? Out. Here you go. Ma. All right. That's a much better way to do it. Okay. So. For the CMEA Bay Section Conference Honor Choir, we have three, Ross Gordon, Ali Fink, and Julia Leonardo. <laughs> Congratulations, great job. Congratulations, great job. Congratulations, great job. All right, now for the Honor Choir USA, and which is going to be held in uh, Honolulu, when? Uh, June 26th through July 2nd. And we have two students that are going to that, Audrey Hudson and Caitlin Lazaro. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Great job to both of you. Scoot over here. For the Western Division American Choral Directors Association Honor Choir, Jeffrey Hill. <laughs> Congratulations, Jeffrey. For the Honors Performance Series finalist, Carnegie Hall, New York City, Sloan Pace. Congratulations, Sloan. And, and both, these both of these for both? both of them, yeah. Okay, so the next two for two different things, Honors Performance Series finalist, <laughs> Carnegie, Carnegie Hall, New York City, and the Western Division American Choral Directors Association <laughs> High School Honor Choir. So we have Alex Betancourt and Aileen Betancourt.
congratulations. We're very proud of both of you. When I was in high school, I was the first student from my high school to go to Honors Choir in Massachusetts, oh and it was one of the highlights of my entire high school experience. So I'm so envious of all of you. I, <laughs> I wish I could go back and do that again, but I do remember the rigor of the audition. It was one of the most nerve-wracking things I've ever done, I think. But anyway, I can really appreciate the accomplishments of all of you. We're very proud of you. And we know you're going to do great things in the rest of your school career and in college. Hope you sing there, too. Mm -hmm. So congratulations. Semicircle, dudes. Find your window. Find your window. Find your window. There you go. They all know what choir is. <laughs> Scoot in, guys. Maybe a couple of the guys in the second row, like Jeffrey I don't back up. There you go, there you go. You've done this before. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be shy, parents. Go on up. Push your way in. Chocolate. One more, guys. One more. All right. Good job. Congratulations. Thank you for doing everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for coming. The parents, too. We appreciate it. Who are the parents? Who are the parents that came? And the student was in here. Are they leaving? Oh, I'll get it to them. <laughs> All right, now we're, we have two more recognitions. And the board and I attended a very special event um, at the Chamber of Commerce sponsors this event every year. It's called the Spice of Life. And they, you know, numerous recognitions at the event, the man of the year, the woman of the year, the small and large businesses of the year. But two of the awards directly impact us, and one is the Educator of the Year, and the other is the Susan Valenta Youth Leadership Award. And we want to recognize the recipients from our district tonight. So I'm going to start with the students. So I'd like to ask Michael Kong to come up. I saw him earlier. I know he's here. And we want to recognize Michael. Michael is just an amazing, gifted young man. I mean, I could talk about him for the next 10 minutes, and I know I can't do that. Um, but he's just an incredible young man. He's at, attending our GECA program, we call it, the T.J. TJ Owens Gilway Early College Academy program. He's a senior. And those... Uh, in his almost four years there, he's been on ASB all four years. This year, he's the president of the ASB, and there have been numerous positive things that have occurred under his leadership. Um, much more school-wide participation, better fundraising, just lots of things that have happened uh, since Michael took that leadership role. So that's one thing I wanted to tell you about him. As you probably can uh, guess, he's an incredible student. It, when this nomination was submitted, he had a weighted, a grade point average of 4.56 and an unweighted four-point GPA. I mean, this kid's smart. <laughs> <laughs> and he's on track for earning his AA at Gavlin. So when he graduates in May, one day he'll receive his high school diploma, the next day he'll receive an AA from Gavlin College. That's an accomplish accomplishment right there. He's also a very good uh, violinist and celloist, and he plays in a, in a symphony, 
and um, not only plays in the symphony, but also takes a leadership role there in various ways that I don't have time to tell you. But <laughs> anyway, he practices, I think, like 12 to 14 hours a week or more. It varies. It varies. <laughs> I, I can't even imagine that. But that, that, it takes a lot of practice to be that good. So congratulations on that, too. And while he's accomplished all of this, without going into details that I, it's not my place to reveal, he's had some incredible challenges in his life and has still overcome them to be where he is today. And so we're very, very proud of you, Michael. We're, I'm glad we could be there to witness you receiving this award at the Spice of Life event. And he gave one of the best uh, acceptance speeches of the night. It was just... <laughs> He's amazing. So, Michael, we have a plaque for you. We're really glad you could come tonight. I know your parents couldn't be here, but please convey to them how proud we are of them, too, for having such an amazing young man. Congratulations. I mean, why don't we do this? Let's do the picture of the student first, and then we'll do yeah. Yeah, Sonia, yeah, why don't you come up? Absolutely. So Principal Sonia Flores, who nominated him, is here. And do we have somebody else? Um, no? Gabriel, his brother. Gabriel, do you want to come in or do you want to take a picture? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> watching you. This guy is going to start a business or something. Oh, I forgot to mention how many com community service hours he already had. Well, at the time of the nomination, I'm sure it's more now. Michael, how many do you have now? <laughs> so he already has 300 plus hours of community service. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> and then uh, the other recipient that we were very proud to be there to witness was the educator of the year, our very own Maria Walker. So Maria, come up. <laughs> and you know, we had pictures. Can we show it of the event? Do you mind putting those up while I'm talking? So um, I wrote Maria's nomination, I confess, with the help of some of her staff. Um, because, as I said in the nomination, I've been superintendent almost 20 years and assistant and deputy superintendent a long time before that. And Maria is one of the best principals that I've had the pleasure of supervising. She just does so many things well. And I, again, I could go on 10 minutes about Maria, but she, um, when we opened Solar Sano, she went there because Sal recruited her, of course, smart move on his part. She was an outstanding English teacher in our district, and he recruited her to go to Solar Sano as the department chair at the time. Of course, uh, he later asked that she become his assistant principal, and when he left, of course, he was advocating for Maria to take his place, and that was a really good decision. Maria's done a great job in all the years that she's been at Solar Sano. One of the things that I mentioned in the nomination, I know the staff that helped me prepare this feel the same way that I do, is because she was such an exceptional teacher, she's an incredibly strong instructional leader. She knows what good teaching is, and she can talk to teachers about that, and she can instruct, particularly the new teachers. She does a great job of mentoring new teachers. And because she does such a great job uh, in many different ways, there's very little turnover at Solarsano. Teachers stay because they want to be in the environment that she's created through her collaborative style, and her mentorship, and just being so supportive, but yet telling people what they need to hear when, they, when that's necessary. So she's created this very positive and nurturing environment at Solar Sano, and that climate permeates not just the staff, but the students. There are very few discipline issues at Solar Sano because of the positive school climate there. As you probably know, Solar Sano is one of the highest performing schools in our district, and has received the California Distinguished School Award, the Gold Ribbon School Award, and Title I Achieving School Award. So these are a testament to Maria's work there since she joined the staff. 
And um, she's also viewed as a leader among her peers. Some of them were shaking their heads a minute ago <laughs> and uh, often has coached and mentored new uh, middle school administrators. And we really appreciate that. I've asked her to be on so many committees that it's incredible. <laughs> uh, you, you know, interview committees, negotiations committees, uh, lots of committees. And that's because she represents her level so well. She really understands and knows middle school thoroughly, which is very different than elementary and high school. So anyway, it's really our honor this evening to recognize Maria for being the 2017, is it 17 or 18? 18. 18. I couldn't remember when they <laughs> drew the line on the year. Educator of the Year. Do we have any public comments? Okay. So agenda item 3D is general public comments, of which we have none. And so now we go to 3E, report of action taken in closed session. And we have two expulsion cases. And the first one is we need to take action here, 2018-12. Move to expel. Second. Second. Okay, uh, motion to expel. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay. Case 2018-13. Move to expel. Second. Pardon? Sorry. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And we did take um, action on case 2014-24. Uh, readmission to um, schools, and that uh, request for readmission was denied in a unanimous 7-0 vote. Okay. <laughs> you want me to dance a little bit? <laughs> okay, so now we have 4A, which are student board representatives report. Sarah Starks from Christopher High School. Hi guys, I'm Sarah Starks, student board rep at Christopher High School, and the site I was assigned was Los Animas Elementary. Okay, so what February at Los Animas consisted of was STEAM club meetings, fifth grade fundraising, family science activity fun night, fifth grade dual immersion tour at South Valley, dual immersion orientation, science fair, technology, and tech buddies. So, STEAM club. So uh, this was started about two years ago by Los Animas alumni, and it stands for Science, Technology, um, Engineering, Art, and Math. And so it's offered to fourth and fifth graders, and it was initially all for, supposed to be for mainly girls. However, um, boys got a little jealous, and so now the ratio of uh, girls to boys is 75% to 25%. And over these past two years, this club has become very popular. It's so popular that they had to create um, two different clubs. So there's STEAM Club 1 and STEAM Club 2. And so it happens every other week. So it's STEAM Club 1, then next Thursday is STEAM Club 2, and then STEAM Club 1 again. And so in each of these clubs, there is uh, 25 kids. Here are some pictures of um, them working on some things in STEAM. Okay, so I remember when I went to Las Animas, we had a lot of fundraising for our um, fifth grade like promotion or graduation. And um, so this year they are doing uh, like Kona Ice, Valentine's Grams, um, and popcorns on Wednesdays. Um, so 
Yeah. Okay, and so coming up is the 10th annual science fair. So um, February 6th, there was a family science activity fun night where they talked about um, science to the parents, the objective of this project, and just an overview of what they're doing. Then on February 28th, the boards are due and they're gonna be all set up in the cafeteria. And um, uh, that night there will be a fair where kids present their projects to teachers and admin and parents. And then for, gate, uh, for <laughs> grades um, kinder through second, um, the class uh, boards are done together, so they all construct a, um, an experiment together and go about uh, the scientific uh, process and such. Okay, so dual immersion. So on February 12th, um, there was a tour um, for like fifth grade students going to South Valley Middle School. Um, and so the parents and students, they were uh, invited to check out the program um, at the middle school for next year. On February 14th and 28th, there's dual immersion orientation. And this is for parents interested in their children being um, included in the Las Animas DI program. And they explain the curriculum and then the objective of this um, class. Okay, so technology. Uh, so younger classes, they have started to use iPads just because it's a lot simpler for um, kids to use iPads rather than Chromebooks. For, so this is for like, uh, kinder through about second grade, and there's uh, six in each of these classrooms, so they do small group projects with them. Um, and then Chromebooks are currently at a one-to-one -one ratio throughout the school. Okay, so there is also a program called Tech Buddies, and so um, upper grade students, um, they're assigned a younger student, and they meet in the computer lab, and they talk about how to properly use technology appropriately, like how to cut and paste and use Google Drive and Google Docs and all the things that we're using currently um, at our like high schools and older schools. Okay, so January at Christopher High, we had our Frosty Fiesta Spirit Week. Uh, then we had our snowball and we started <laughs> Operation Interdependence. Okay, so our Frosty, our Frosty Fiesta Spirit Week, um, the theme was 80s Strike Back. So on Monday, we had Ferris Bueller's Day Off, so that was like a pajama day. Uh, Tuesday was 16 Candles, so it was the classic 80s attire. Wednesday was Back to the Future, so you can dress like what you'd like to be in the future or maybe what you dress like when you were younger. And Thursday was Breakfast Club, which was um, our rally day. And so the freshmen were nerds. Sophomores were jocks, juniors were rebels, and seniors were prince and princesses. So here's some pictures. And then we had our snowball, um, which was ultimately themed um, to achieve like uh, the same theme as uh, the, show, the popular show, Stranger Things. However, it was pretty general for everybody at the same time. So, so February, um, we have our Operation Interdependence. Um, so we write letters and gather uh, toiletries and uh, treats for our troops overseas. Today was actually our um, letter writing night. And then um, we had a Heart Health Awareness Day where everybody wore red. Um, and then uh, yesterday we had Valentine's Day fun where there were uh, lunchtime activities um, for everybody to watch and um, enjoy uh, in the celebration of the Day of Love. And then um, a couple weeks ago, we had Cougar Palooza, which um, introduced the new freshmen to our school. And they were able to discover like all of the clubs that we have and all of our activities like uh, band and choir and all the sports that we have to offer. So, yeah, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Nicely done, Sarah, thank you. And now we have our superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, as always, every month, I have a lot of uh, regularly scheduled meetings, and some of those, uh, the board president and vice president join me. So um, we had our monthly meeting with the mayor and city administrator this past Tuesday. We had a really good discussion about several topics. I'm really glad that we had an opportunity to talk to them about topics that are of mutual interest to us. And then I also have a lunch meeting every month, which I had last week with the city administrator and Gavilan president, and we get a chance to talk about issues that the three agencies share in common. So those are very good meetings. 
uh, have a monthly meeting with the GTA president, Jonathan Bass, and with Paul Winslow. And we had our facilities committee. So there's just some monthly meetings that we have every month. But this month, I also had some interesting meetings that I don't normally have in a month. And one of those I want to highlight for you, I had um, some members of our management team and I met uh, with Travis Allen and Michael Edwards from iSchool Initiative. And iSchool Initiative is a really interesting initiative. I don't have time to tell you about it now, but I want to introduce it to you now because I'd like to bring them to our district. I heard Travis Allen speak at the superintendent's symposium. And after going to you know, some superintendent's symposiums for a long time now, it's the most excited I've ever been at any of the symposiums. This guy has so many good things to say that we need to hear as a school district about how we're using technology for teaching and learning. And it's not about the devices. And that's the first thing that he will challenge all of us to think about when he comes to speak to us. What we're working on right now is having him come and speak to the management team at, in June and actually would like to invite the board to participate. We're working on the details right now of that uh, one day retreat, which will be focused on, first you'll get to hear his keynote that I heard, and then a one day visioning process about how we're going to use technology in our district. And this isn't another initiative. This is to get people to really talk about and come together around what our goals are for the technology that we have in our classrooms. Is uh, Basically, he's agnostic on the, on the devices because he said it's not about the devices, it's what we use them for. So anyway, we're really excited about this and in fact, tomorrow morning, uh, members of our team will have a second follow-up discussion uh, with his team about uh, this plan uh, for middle of June for our management retreat. Um, we also had a visit by Kave yesterday to South Valley Middle School. A team came to evaluate their uh, possibility of being selected as a Seal of Excellence school, which is quite an honor, and we're very excited about that. We hope they'll be selected. And this morning, I attended the annual CalSOAP Governing Board Retreat which is a once a year thing, obviously. We had three APS visits. I think we're done, are we? I keep saying that. I guess yeah, it's one wishful. More. One, more. one more. We conduct APS visits at all 15 school sites in the middle of the school year. And those are very in-depth visits where we use instruments uh, that basically describe what we'd like to see in classrooms and how the schools are doing as compared to the, their instruments or ours, and sometimes it's a combination. So we went to South Valley, Gilroy High, and uh, this week to Gilroy Prep, which was a really interesting visit when you think about how a school is using technology, because they have a lot of technology and they're using it very effectively. We had negotiations this month with all three of our bargaining units, and we're working hard to come to resolution with all three bargaining units. We hope in the near future, but we're working on a lot of topics at the table. And we have coming up our, our uh, I always call it the winter, winter break. Other people call it the President's Week vac vacation. But anyway, school is closed next week. We won't have any school. And the district office, just for the public, will only be open Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Gekka will be open, but they do have Friday and Monday off, so they have a little bit of our break. They follow the Gavlin College schedule. We also have a couple of other important events coming up. On March 2nd is Read Across America, so at all of our elementary schools, we'll have members of the community and others reading to students, and if you haven't signed up yet, please do. We need more volunteers to read to students that morning. It's always in the morning, and it's Dr. Seuss's birthday, so that's the why, why it's a nationwide thing. And on March 10th, we have the run for fitness in the morning. So we hope lots of students will be there and lots of supporters. And we do have, I am starting my spring site visits after we finish this last APS. And as you know, on fall and spring visits, the board members are welcome to join me for the visit, but please let me know if you're coming just so I can make sure we don't have too many at one site. But um, upcoming, or the first one is Elliott on February 28th, ADB on March 6th, and El Roble on March 7th. 
And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is item five, consent agenda. I need a motion to approve. So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And now we have 6A, Measure E and Measure P, Citizens Oversight Committee Report. Chairpersons of Measure E and Measure P, Citizens Oversight Committee will present an updated report on behalf of the committee. Good evening, uh, Dr. Flores, board members, and, uh, and audience. Uh, we are here to present the Measure P and the Measure E um, reports to the board. Our, report, our person that was supposed to report was Paul Nadal, and he didn't show up. So uh, Dave Silva, who's also on the board, he represents both Measure E and Measure P, is going to step in. So. Uh, basically, he's kind of flat-footed because he wasn't prepared for this, so try and be kind to him. But uh, basically, um, that's all you got to do is just, uh, just say basically measure E, measure E, and measure P. Citizens, it's like over here reporting to those. Just don't have that. Just say that. It's fine. Uh, just say I'm here to present. I'm here to present a measure P and the measure E Citizens Oversight Committee report. Thank you. <laughs> so the board does have the board does have those reports. Does and you've had a chance to read them. Does the board have any questions? Yes. I just wonder if you could clarify for the audience why this citizens oversight committee is necessary. Oh sure. You want to let me do that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Being I'm unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> He's kind of flat footed. The measure the the citizens oversight committee is uh, is appointed by the board. And basically what their job is is to oversee the spending for the bond uh, funds and make sure that they're spent in the right way and according to the bond, um, uh, bo the bond uh, language. So we have two bonds still going. We had Measure P, which started in 2008, and then we had another um, uh, bond, another general obliga obligation bond that started in, uh, in 2016. And so we're, we're overlapping the two bonds. So these, we have eight uh, or seven committee members and they sit on both of the committees. One sits on, um, or, or they, they sit on the Measure P and then we adjourn from the Measure P and do the Measure E. So it's quite a bit of work, but uh, we, we, we sit down and we give, tell them, give, out the, give them all of our updates, uh, give them the, uh, the, 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 any of the, um, the reports that we come, you know, that we have, and they overview uh, what we're doing each each August. We take we go out and take a tour of the site so they can see what we're doing, and see where the money's being spent, and make sure the money's being spent in the right place. So, they are a very important piece. Uh, anytime you have that kind of a money, you're, you know, the first one was 150, 150 million, and the second one was 170 million. You really want a uh, citizen group to oversee the the spending of those funds, and they've done a one, absolutely wonderful job. So. Sir, in a sentence, have, has the district been spending the bond funds uh, appropriately? I believe they have. Thank you we very meet much. We <laughs> quarterly and go through the budget, and then, like he said, once a year in August, we take a tour, the whole group, and visit the ongoing projects, and it appears that everything is going smoothly. Thank you. Are there other members of the, uh, the board here this evening? Mm -hmm. Oh, Dave. Oh. Dave and Jay. All right. And Jay. Thank yeah. you all for uh, all your work. Thank you so much. Yeah, we really appreciate it because I know that's a few meetings a year with a lot of detailed information, and it's important that we uh, make sure that the public has confidence that we're spending the money the way we said we would in the bond language. So having you independently review that is very important. Trustee Good? I'd also like to thank the committee for its efforts. We appreciate it. It's, it's important. It's a lot of money. It's good that there's another set of eyes on this. I just wanted to note on the uh, Measure E, and it's probably been done since, since this report was prepared, it says that uh, we approved a new elementary school, and, and that's true, but, but then we unapproved it. <coughs> <laughs> so those are going to be going to uh, the two junior high schools in, mm -hmm. in much need. So I'm sure you're aware of that, yes. but just for the record. Thank you very much again. Any other questions? 
Trustee Mitgard. I just wanted to make a comment that I appreciate you taking this committee on a field trip to see what we've done. Yes. Because the board is aware of this and we go and see the projects all the time. But I'm glad that you're able to see. It's one thing to read about it. It's another thing to yes. see what we're doing. So thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate you stepping up. Yeah. 6D facilities and maintenance operations monthly update. Mr. Bombacci. Yes, thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll get started here. Um, again, Dr. Flores, board members, and audience. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with the first part our, is our uh, cash flow projections. And as uh, Julie's not here to present, I think that Alvaro's going to speak on that, so I'll let him facilitate that. Good evening, board. Good evening, superintendent and audience. Um, this is the typical cash flow that you're used to seeing with a modification of the bottom that highlights the state eligibility. As you know, we have some modernization eligibility, some new construction eligibility. And so what we've created is a record of those, calling out those eligibility by site because it does vary by site. So right now we're working on the Gilroy High School, obviously modernization, because we're putting a two-story building out there, a cost of $14 million. We can get a share of the state uh, to a 60-40 match. The total from the state would then be the 773000 Of course, that does not equate to 60% of $14 million, but we'll take whatever we can get for the state. There's a lot of hoops to jump through. Um, we got to get in the queue. We got to do all this filing and reporting, and we're happy to do that just to make sure we have a chance at all these uh, matches from the state. Um, the $725,000 that is um, highlighted here corresponds to the Rucker one that we've already secured and is in um, our funds. The $200,000 interest um, essentially fluctuating between now and the subsequent years is interest that we uh, anticipate to earn in the fund, in the bond funds. And then that just highlights uh, what I just discussed with Gilroy High School. Uh, the next piece just Alvaro, shows the... can you go back to the developer fees? Because a couple people have asked me, how are we doing on developer fees this year? Yeah, it's tracking down to, I think, uh, $2.3, $2 $2.4 million. We're not to the point in the second interim where we're going to take that up, but it's tracking very closely to the budget. Um, at this point, we're not going to change it for the second interim that you'll see in about a month or so, um, simply because that can fluctuate. And I was just in a meeting with a developer that told me that it's not so easy for them to ramp up uh, construction of homes. So we're, we're taking that slow, and there's no incentive for us to go out there and overproject those revenues. So I think it's rather prudent for us to be cautious in estimating developer fees. And what that says is that, you know, one year we had uh, $5 million collected in developer fees. That was a peak. You will never see me budget $5 million out of the gate because we don't usually uh, receive $5 million. So the, we are uh, to a point where we start with a year of $1.5 million and then increment those revenues to match what the collections are once we receive them. So we'll never be out of 90% range effectively, um, but there's just n really no benefit to us to go out there on a limb and say we're gonna collect $4 million and then you collect two and a half. Um, it's just not prudent for us. It pays for our debt service. Um, that's the 1.7 million that you see out there. We took, um, on the slide, it's, you'll see it's somewhat small, but it says annual 2008 COP payments. We're not paying any police officers out there, guys. <laughs> uh, these are certificate of participation payments. It's a debt instrument, basically a big credit card worth $30 million that we took out in 2008 to finish some projects. That's what that is. Um, we're highlighting the expenditure, so you'll note um, primarily, I hope that it doesn't, it does bump up. Okay, so what we're highlighting on the bottom is essentially the shifting gears of, like Trustee uh, Good alluded to earlier, um, we're not uh, building the elementary yet. The birth rates are down, uh, we're declining in enrollment, um, and we've declined. Uh, so we're shifting gears towards the middle schools and focusing on South Valley and Brownell. So these cash flows um, effectively tell you that. Um, down at the bottom, South Valley um, feasibility study, major renovations. We anticipate that to effectively take place over the next couple of years. We're hitting hard 
both feasibility studies for Brownell and South Valley, and then letting those feasibility studies determine which site to move on as quickly as possible, because we are on the time frame to spend these bonds by January 2020. So that, that's critical for us to note. So the cash flows can and will vary. This is cash, um, but most importantly, um, we're uh, engaging in the feasibility studies at both middle schools right now. Okay, and then this is just the uh, latter part of it, so that we're looking at the projected bonds and the issuance of these bonds. That, again, can fluctuate with assessed valuations. Julie takes it all the way to 2026, where we anticipate to issue the last series of, of, of Measure P. Uh, in year 2025, you see that $28 million. It's hard to see, but it says future series bond sale proceeds from Measure P. We have an outstanding issuance equal to $28 million. We can't issue that right now. The assessed valuations will support it. So we um, think that we can uh, issue it by year 2025, and that's what the cash flow demonstrates. That's really the highlight of that, uh, that slide. And the last page is just uh, showing you what's available in the bottom line with the number of projects, including energy um, and other projects that we have. Understand that these aren't budgets, these are cash flows. Cash flows do change, um, so the budget is separate from these cash flows. So do you have any questions on, yes? Could you remind us, how long does a feasibility study take? We're about? actually, um, actually Jim Bambachik can probably answer that. Uh, right now we're gathering proposals from at least three architectural firms. Mm -hmm. We've secured one for Brownell, one for South Valley from an architectural firm. Right. and are waiting for the other two uh, proposals. But uh, Jim can, can let you know that. Yeah, we're actually, we're, uh, we're anticipating uh, to be at the board meeting in, the second board meeting in March uh, with the information. So uh, we'll know which one, which of the schools we need to move forward with and uh, how soon, and which one we are gonna have to basically wait for, uh, given the information that we get from, from the study, so. But the actual feasibility. The actual, I'm sorry? The actual feasibility study, how long is that? Take? The actual feasibility study, uh, the, way that, the way that we're doing it right now, that shouldn't take, probably will take, we'll have the information front loaded so we can get direction, but the actual feasibility study will probably take about two months, maybe two and a half. Mm. Great, I thought it was gonna be a lot longer than that for some reason. No, they should, they should because they have the uh, master plan, they should be able to move pro oh, fairly yeah, quickly. Okay. Great, thank you. Any further questions on cash flow? Right. Thank you. Okay, so as it is the, the winter and we're preparing for all the projects we have this summer, which are quite a few, uh, we are working on one main project right now, which is the Gilroy High School new math building, and it's the uh, phase three modular construction portion. Uh, the foundations, uh, the foundation is being prepared and I say foundation because we have one of the buildings that we're doing first, we're gonna set the buildings, then we're gonna dig the foundation for the other one and set the buildings because the crane has to come in and if we set, if we dug the foundation for both the buildings, the crane wouldn't be able to set uh, where it needs to in order to put the, the buildings on, on the, uh, the wing. So the wing that we're preparing right now is the one that goes along the, the, uh, the field. The one that goes along the field, the second one we'll be doing is the one that goes along the track side uh, the first 10 classroom wing is to be delivered uh, beginning March 12th. They originally wanted to deliver them on the 9th, and I put a stop to that quickly because, as you all know, there will not be 8 million things in the parking lot for the run for fitness. So. <laughs> we made that very clear, and, uh, and we listen. <laughs> and here's some of the pictures. On the left side, that's where we started. That's the asphalt is still sitting there. You saw pictures from when we did all the work doing, putting the lime treatment in the soil, and now we come back and we cut the soil, and you always know when soil's been treated with lime because you see the vertical, the vertical sides of these ditches. Uh, they're really hard to cut through. They're really heavily uh, scarified, and, uh, and uh, you, just, you can tell from a mile away when you've done, um, it's almost like digging into concrete. And the green posts that are coming out of the ground, those are the drainages for the building, for underneath the building, it has to have drainage. Uh, you see here on the left side, they're digging the, the, the two, uh, they, they've got three uh, ditches that they're digging. 
The one in the middle was added on, and, and we had brought that to the board before, uh, extra payment, uh, because they had to put an extra grade beam in there because they, there was some liquefaction issues with the soil, so they, and the engineers decided they needed another grade beam going down the middle. And then you see here, you'll start seeing where the mod lines are, and that's where the in buildings come together and sit. And you can also see, I'm gonna go back one, uh, on the left-hand side here, you can see our fences up now. Uh, if, for those of you who are out there on the tour, if you recall, that was just a, uh, I think it was just a uh, retaining wall with posts, but our fence is actually up there now. So we'll be moving that other uh, fence out. And here's where you see the big checkerboards where you can see all that's gonna be uh, filled in with rebar. And uh, I think that one is on the next, oh, no. On this page right here, you can see the rebar coming in down the middle. So they'll fill it up with rebar, put, the, put in the concrete, get it at grade, they'll cut all those green uh, pieces. <coughs> and then uh, after March 12th, they'll start setting the buildings in the parking lot and then move them onto the site. So I expect by about the, about the end of March, uh, April, around beginning of April, we'll see the buildings uh, uh, being erected and probably almost completed. They go really fast, so. So we're still, uh, we're doing really well. We're on, 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 uh, on schedule for sure uh, to meet our August deadline, so. Good evening, Dr. Flores, President Paceno and School Board. I have four items for you tonight. Uh, the first, I think uh, most of you are quite familiar with uh, the sod that was installed out uh, at Gilroy High in the softball and baseball field. I think several of you got to go out there and actually walk on the field and see how impressive it was. Uh, this would not have been possible, I want to say it again, without Billy Holler. Uh, what we were able to uh, achieve out there was incredible. So the district did pay for the sod. It was $57,537.29. Uh, uh, my crew was involved in upgrading the irrigation and uh, had a big part in actually placing the sod. And just that they were involved in this project and working with Billy and his staff, it was a really positive experience for our crew. I just want to acknowledge what a positive effect he had on our guys. All of our grounds crew did work on that at one time or another. We did, uh, Dr. Flores recognized uh, two of our staff, actually three of our staff last uh, board meeting. Uh, we're very proud of this project. Uh, the next one is ratification of cost of services with MBS. I think, again, you're familiar with what uh, happened out at Solar Sano. We had some underground gas repairs that need to, needed to be fixed. Uh, we repaired every underground entrance into the buildings on that site over the winter break. Uh, MBS is a fantastic company to work with. Um, I'm hoping I never have to see them again or call them to come to the district. Maybe I'll get a phone call to uh, pass along a reference, but uh, our experience with them, uh, the, the several projects they've done in the district, they have done a fantastic job for us. Uh, the next one is a contract with Coastal Sports Flooring for the refinish of the Gilroy High School main gym. Uh, unfortunately, the floor on the main gym was uh, done in 2012. It's had some pretty heavy use, um, uh, probably uh, not the right uh, finish put on at one time, so it's delaminating right now, and the only fix for that is to do a total resand. Uh, normal schedule would probably be uh, a year or two from now, but we're a little bit ahead of schedule of having to get this done but it is necessary. The floor is delaminating on the finish and it's becoming a trip hazard. So we obtained two, two quotes for that, uh, one, one from High Floors and one from uh, Coastal Sports Flooring. This is tentatively planned for the uh, first week of May through the third week of May to be done. And that's been cleared with the site for uh, any scheduled activities it won't interfere with. Next one is a contract with R&T Specialties. They're our prime vendor for our lunch table repairs in our MPRs. Uh, they came out to service uh, three tables at El Roble and they found uh, they had broken hardware. They replaced those and fixed them uh, at the cost of $2,800 for three tables, but they also inspected the rest of the tables and found that they are all having the same issues and will, in a matter of time, fail. So we're buying new hardware that's an upgraded version. It's not a paint-coated, it's a powder-coated hardware. It should last uh, indefinitely. These tables are original tables, but they're in very good shape. So we should, uh, this is money well spent to fix these tables. If we were to replace them, it would be well over $60,000. <clears> 
A couple things we've done in maintenance here. I, I think I advised you that we had some issues at the Brownell gym with the ceiling tiles falling. Uh, the picture on the left is some of the tiles where there's a void where they've fallen. Uh, some other pictures I think I shared in subcommittee. I don't think you can see it in this one, but the, they actually have taken impact from basketballs and things like that that started to uh, start the tiles to fall down. And the picture on the right is what it looks like now. All the acoustic treatments have been removed and everything cleaned. I'm pretty hopeful we can leave it like this and not have to add anything. Uh, so far, the reports back from the site is that this is acceptable. And this is a picture of the softball field. I don't think we've shared this before, but this was right after the sod was rolled out, so it looks incredibly well, just like the uh, baseball field. We also have done some renovation work uh, without Billy's help, but with our own crew and some of the equipment we have. I'm not that bad, am I? <laughs> it's not you, Dan. It's 8 o'clock. Exactly one hour on the nose. And well, you guys know your times. <laughs> Uh, but we also <laughs> renovated the uh, practice fields and have made a big difference. Uh, there's still a little bit of a gopher issue Dan, out in the practice field. Dan, but, uh, yes. may I suggest you take just a couple of minutes to... Oh, sure, sure. Wait until out. we have our uh, audience <laughs> leave. <laughs> I cleared the room, didn't I? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Now Thank I can you. hear you. <laughs> so this is the softball field, which uh, the site, again, is extremely happy about. It was nice to do something equitable for the softball field. But our guys, I wanted to mention, did use a, a renovator machine that we purchased a while back out on the practice fields, and it really made a big difference. And this is something we're hoping to do at all our fields uh, in the next several months. It's a process, but we can improve the condition of our fields greatly. Just keep your fingers crossed we get some rain so we can keep moving forward. Uh, another thing, our, almost everybody in our staff was due for forklift and uh, scissor lift and boom training. We had two days of actual very intensive training. We've had this training, it, it has to be done every three to five years. This is probably the most uh, intense training our guys have had uh, and with a huge focus on safety. So I, I'm real happy we were able to do this uh, and only about 90% of our crew were due but they're all certified now. And one thing I did not mention, um, next week I'm scheduled to go to two workshops that are uh, directed by the Department of Pesticide Regulations for our IPM, Integrated Pest Management. I will be learning hopefully some more tricks and trades uh, uh, to help our schools stay healthy. Uh, one of them is how to treat gophers uh, organically. That's so we're, we're looking forward to that. Hopefully uh, we'll get some new tools. You gotta keep those fields in good shape. <laughs> we're trying. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we have, first of all, I want to go back to 6A. Oh, good. Because we did not take action on 6A. I apologize for that. So I need uh, a motion. I'd move to approve the report. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of accepting the reports for Measure E and P Citizens Oversight Committee say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. Now, 6C through F. Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. You guys Thank must you. love this, right? Yeah, this it's is not great. 10 o'clock. Thank you very much. 8.03, <laughs> not bad. Thank you. Sorry your audience left you. <laughs> <laughs> they were spellbound, though. <laughs> okay, 7A, monthly district cash flow update. Information item, Kimberly Mason, Director of Fiscal Services. Thank you. Good evening, mm -hmm. Superintendent Dr. Flores and board members. So this is our monthly update. Um, this still reflects the first interim totals. However, right now I'm currently working on um, second interim with the staff, and probably by the next time we bring this to you, it'll reflect those totals. So these are actuals from the beginning of the school year until the end of January, and then the rest are projections at this time. So if you look at January column, you've got a little over 22.5 million 
um, as your starting balance. And then the revenue for that month is a little over 13 million. And the total expenditures are a little over 10.6 million. And then we did pay back 50% of the TRAN in January and the balance will be paid back in April. And so with the TRAN still, our ending cash flow would be a little over $22.6 million there. And our payroll for that month was 78% of the total expenditures. And this is just another chart, just looking at it a different way after payroll has uh, hit the books. Now, any questions? Any questions or comments, trustees? <laughs> Mm. Patricia, you're laughing at my picture. <laughs> it looks just like all the laughing. <laughs> I had a woman there, but it didn't come out very well, so they changed it on me. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And item 7B, Kil Gilroy Teachers Association Staff Development Input Survey Results. Jonathan Bass, GTA President. Should do it. There we go. Okay. Good evening, Superintendent Flores, President Paseno, and members of the Board of Education. I'm Jonathan Bass, President of Gilroy Teachers Association. The collective bargaining agreement between Gilroy Teachers Association and GUSD requires three days out of the work year to be set aside for staff development. For 2017-18, some of the staff de the development on these days is provided by the Santa Clara County Office of Education through a Memorandum of Understanding with GUSD. The Memorandum of Understanding describes the goal of this partnership as providing professional development to K-12 teachers in continued preparation for standards-based instruction in the areas of math, science, visual and performing arts, career technical education, and English language development. The cost of this agreement to GUSD is $24,300 for 36-hour training sessions. Gilroy Teachers Association has adopted a three-pronged vision for the 2017-18 school year. We're working to make ourselves into more than a labor union in, in the traditional sense of representing teachers. Gilroy Teachers Association seeks to become essential to the overall operation of Gilroy Unified School District, valued for its contributions to making the district a great educational organization. We have developed a three-pronged approach to creating a role for ourselves in supporting teachers in their craft, supporting the district office administrators in establishing spending priorities in planning staff development, and supporting members of the Board of Education in their need for data to make informed spending decisions. With respect to our second prong, GTA believes that our expertise can be tapped to improve teaching and learning. In order to learn what this expertise is, GTA administered a survey during the month of January. Tonight, as we share our survey results, we hope to demonstrate to the Board of Education and to district administration that Gilroy Teachers Association cares about staff development, wants to work with Gilroy Unified School District to make staff development the best it can be, and has expertise to share with its own members through professional development. In our survey, we posed the question, if provided an opportunity to be a paid staff developer, do you have an idea for a staff development offering that you would be willing and able to provide? We received 45 yes responses to our question. The majority of those yes responses came from teachers. All grade levels were represented in the yes answers. 
teachers from various subject areas were represented among the yes answers, and teachers from across the district were also represented. A variety of staff development concepts were presented. These concepts span several object, subject areas to improve learning across the curriculum. So incorporating music into daily lessons, thinking maps, reading for a purpose, enhancing classroom management and lessons with words, gestures, and fun using whole brain teaching. Those are some of them. <coughs> Ideas for improving classroom management were presented, and these ranged from enabling teamwork to increasing focus <coughs> to developing a growth mindset. Respondents offered to share with their colleagues expertise with technological resources. And so some of those are coming up on your screen. Working with Google Forms, there is a, someone who uh, can work with computer modeling for biology. Aries Gradebook was another one that came up. Trainings were described for special education relating to communication, common core standards, and IEPs. And altogether, staff development ideas covered a variety of topics related to resources and skills to support teachers in their craft. Everything from best practices in the elementary language arts program to using something called race strategy for answering constructed responses. Given the willingness and capacity to provide staff development communicated by these survey results, GTA is proposing that our association be allowed to provide staff development on just one of the three staff development days of the 2018-19 school year. GTA believes there is much to be gained by implementing our proposal. Allowing our association to provide staff development gives a chance for certif certificated staff to shine, leading to increased morale. GTA unit members are familiar with the day-to-day -day needs of their colleagues, so they have a sense of the types of staff development that are needed. The variety of staff development ideas that have been proposed creates a broad field of options from which teachers may choose. Our proposal may turn out to be a fantastic idea that can be nurtured into an outstanding staff development program. There is also a financial benefit to implementing this proposal. Assuming the current MOU between GUSD and SCCOE, which provides for 30 six-hour training sessions, if GTA is given just one day to provide staff development, this could replace 10 of those six-hour training sessions. One six-hour training session per the current MOU with SCCOE costs $810. At the current hourly rate in the GTA GUSD collective bargaining agreement, that same six hour session would cost just $322 if provided by a GTA unit member. This represents a savings of $488 for the cost of one six hour training session for one entire staff development day. In other words, for 10 six hour sessions, this represents a savings of $4,880. GTA believes there is very little risk involved in this proposal. Even if the staff development was a complete, a complete flop because the trainings turned out to be ineffective or were poorly received, what is lost is one day. When assessing this risk, it's important to remember that staff development days have flopped before. I myself attended a staff uh, science training session two years ago where no trainer showed up it seemed that no arrangements had been made for a trainer. Just this last August, one teacher shared with me a description of the August 15, 2000 Staff Development Day. She wrote, we had one presenter for 70 to 80 teachers for a technology training. Teachers who piloted the program were in the same room with brand new teachers to our district. Most of us couldn't see the screen to follow along from so far back in the library. The point here is not to put down GUSD staff development efforts. 
like most of what educators do, these efforts are a mix of successes and failures. Risking one additional staff development day is worth the potential benefit. And thank you for your time. Feel free to ask any questions. Questions or comments, trustees? Trustee Good. I, I think the basic concept is great. Um, just like any other presenter, we would have to look at who's going to do the presenting, look at the lesson plan, it's, and, and get an idea, because we would at least want to have an expectation that it's not going to flop. Right, of course. That's the idea, so, not to flop. So the, devil, <laughs> so the devil's in the details, but if it could be worked out, I, I like it. Okay. Trustee Ambrosso? Reading the proposal, um, again, it, it seems like a reasonable uh, option to consider and uh, because I have always felt that we have great expertise in our district and uh, I think we are, you know, we're a uh, demonstration district uh, that has a lot of innovative programs and we have a lot of it innovative leaders in our district, so I'm very open to that possibility. Okay. I'd like to point out that we already use a lot of teachers for our staff development. In fact, I provided you this weekend with the chart of our current staff development and how many teachers are providing our staff development this year. So we believe there is value in having teachers provide staff development. We use many teachers for our staff development. I'd be happy to share the two charts with you, Jonathan. Maybe you don't realize how many teachers are already offering Mm -hmm. professional development to our staff. Great. Is that part of like a TOSA's role? Is, is there any of that? Some, but there? some of them are not TOSA's that do the professional development and some of it's our best PD. Yeah. As um, some of our current teachers that are offered, especially, especially at secondary. Um, we also have to keep in mind that we do have uh, professional development that we need to provide. You know, when we're adopting new textbooks, for instance, we have to have publishers come in and teach teachers how to use those. So, and we do have a committee by contract um, where the committee gives us advice on our professional development. And we had a lot of teacher participation in that this past year. And we, we expect to have a lot of teacher participation again this year. In fact, it was mostly teachers giving us ideas about our professional development. So we're not open to using teachers. We do it all the time and they you're not close to it. You are open to it. Where, did I say? You are not open. <laughs> did I? <laughs> I'm, having, I'm having a rough night, yeah. Jonathan. You know, no, that's, that's okay. I've, I've misplaced like five important things in this board meeting. So I, anyway. I didn't even catch the misspeak. I, I did want to add to, to what Mark said. Just like the devils in the details for how, you know, what exactly is being offered. When soliciting people, the devils in the details on how they're solicited. Like, for example, um, I, you know, I put this out, I got over 200 responses and 45 yeses. And, you know, they're not all perfect response. You know, out of those 45, I imagine we could probably get at least 30 good trainings or so. Um, but, you know, on the, and on the other hand, there, there's also, the district has its own effort. It's, it's, a, it's a Google sheet and it, it takes a different, takes a totally different approach. And I'm not sure what the results are, but I'm not sure if the district is saying the same, um, you know, Look what we have to offer. So I, I really think it's important that in doing this, that the district and, and GTA work very closely together on exactly how to word questions, how people provide input, because um, like anything else, it, just a shade difference in the way something's asked or presented can be the difference between getting 100 responses and getting two responses. So. I would just like to say that back in the dinosaur age when I was a principal, those three days of staff development are pretty precious. And to give up a third of them is, um, to me, makes me nervous. But I think, um, I know that there are trainings that schools do on um, staff develop, I mean, on uh, staff meeting days mm -hmm. and in other ways. And maybe that's where some of this can start to the point where it can evolve into a staff development day. But a lot of that is going on already. Right. In fact, in 
quite a few principals have shared that their own teachers are doing mm -hmm. that PD on their staff meeting days. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we can continue to talk about it. I just okay. uh, wanted to mention, I work for the County Office of Education, and we have three staff development days. We only do inside training, and we are from the County Office of Education. We've been doing that for about five years now. Mm -hmm. So all of our staff development is done by teachers mm -hmm. for three full days. And we have a variety of choices. So that's something we've been doing for a long time. Mark? Yeah, I'd just like to say, Jonathan, any, anything that can help us avoid flying in from someone from out of state and paying them $20,000 for one day and keeping it in-house and lowering our costs, I'm all for that. Then I won't move to Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> Any other right. comments or questions? All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have 7C, our favorite item. Second reading of updates to board policies. Right, and there were some uh, suggestions or recommendations at the last board meeting, and so we did follow up on that with our legal counsel, and I shared with you her comments in response to those recommendations. Right, it's, and so uh, in keeping with the recommendations from, by our attorney, I would uh, like, I, I, it would be my preference to delete board policy 500 and board policy 1113 and keep the remaining ones. One, 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 three. Can you repeat that again? Yeah, can you say that again? I go five. <laughs> On the website one. Okay. Yeah, but it's zero five zero zero accountability, right? And the yeah. other is the website one. And the right. other is the website one. Eleven thirty. Yeah. Those, those are the ones our council said we could right. safely without any risk right. leave. And the others she felt we should keep. Mm -hmm. Any questions or comments from trustees? Well, let me let me pull it up. I'm sorry. The, the one that you're talking about, is that's where the guidance on the website? Yeah, Same one of them is about what you post on your website. That's totally at the di district's discretion. That's it's, it's not realistic even. Yeah, the, yeah the, the, it's not possible to do what's in here. Right. So if you approve the board policy, you'd be violating it the second you approved it. Right. So deleting 1113 and 500. Right. So in the absence of not uh, of having no policy, sta stated policy, what, what does that leave us? The district will continue to do what it's currently doing. Which is? We have a district website, and we ha our sites have websites, but we don't control their websites. So this gives us the discretion to do what we can on both versus being man by board policy being mandated to do what it says in this policy. Provide guidance. Well, it's more than that. The, I mean, the board policy has, I mean, you have to read the whole policy. But. All, all, you don't have to go any further than the first sentence. Superintendent or designee shall establish design standards for district and school, school websites in order to maintain a consistent identity, professional appearance, and ease of use. Who, who's going to do that? Our superintendent is going to do it. Are we going to hire a consultant? Well, we would it? have to hire someone. We've talked about this before. If we want to improve our district website and have the sites be consistent with us, then we need a web webmaster. We can't do it. So Okay, so based, because we don't have a person, we just don't want to be put in the position. We don't want to commit. Well, it's, to it's, 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 more, it's more than that. Look at the guidelines for website content. The superintendent or designee shall develop content guidelines for district and school websites and shall assign staff to review and approve content prior to posting. So I'm, I'm at the uh, home and school club at Los Animas School and I want to put out we're going to have a bake sale. Well, who's that going to go to to approve that? This, this policy is completely unwieldy. We don't have the personnel. It's not possible to implement it unless we have a lot more money to hire people. Yeah. And issues like federal law, like. Americans with Disability Act apply regardless of what uh, whether this you policy have this says. policy or not, right? And by the way, we're we're in the process of reviewing that, the accessibility issue. 
all districts are looking at that right now, for instance, accessibility for the blind, accessibility for hard of hearing. Mm -hmm. Think, you know, we have to address that anyway, and we're working on that, so whether we have this policy or not. So, so again, just to be clear, so we, we have no, no stated policy regarding guidance of, regarding websites. We just simply leave it open-ended at this point. Most of the secondary sites all use School Loop currently. Next year's it'll be Aries. But as far as their website and what they post on it, like Gilroy High, you've been on it many times, that's at the discretion of the site. We don't have anybody here that, is, that could monitor 15 websites. Right. School Loop is imposing some structure that is common to all of them, but that's secondary the, only. Uh, Elementary, those are School Loop pages too. Only the well, we yeah, won't get right. into that. So it, well, that's the de, that's the de facto policy. The web server is imposing design criteria. Just the design, not the content. Right. The content's more, I think, what this is about. Okay. okay. Any other? We uh, would love to have a webmaster, <laughs> but that would cost a lot of money, I'm sure. Yeah. Any other questions or comments on? Well, so the main reason is because of the, the budget limitation. Sure, we have nobody to implement. Mm -hmm. We don't have staff to implement that board policy. And we need a webmaster in order to do it. Or somebody, somebody. who has the skills to do it. And then, you know, if, if a lot of this is about the content and how it would be developed, monitored, all that. We don't, that's, that takes a lot of time. Just maintaining ours at the level that we maintain it is very difficult. We could do a much better job if we had somebody with the skills to do it, but thanks to Gina and Lucy, we keep it pretty much up to date with current information, but it takes a lot of time just to do what we're doing. Oh, absolutely, I, I, I get that. I'm just, I just wanna be clear on the basis of why we're, we're choosing not to have a policy, because in effect, we're having no policy. But we can't do what this board policy board states. Policy. A board policy. Right. This board policy is, you might as well have, we're going to be flying around in, in flying cars, because the board policy says we have to fly around flying cars. You can right. either do it or you can't. And it's, to me, it doesn't make any sense pass a policy that we can't implement correct okay I got and it's optional right so there's some things in here employees home addresses shall not be posted even without this policy presumably the we district not will not do such yes. things and right photos of students only uh, with parents permission well this says if the names if you don't name the students, you can put their photos on. We don't do that. That's yeah. not our practice. Right. We have to have parent permission before their pictures are used. Okay. All right. What's 500 all about? <laughs> There's accountability. To ensure accountability is okay. good performance. Any other questions, comments? There were a couple other changes. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I didn't get a new copy, so presumably those have been integrated in the, the official one. Um, like a, removing the word. Uh, there was From the last significant week? CEQA versus CEQA. Oh, that you discussed like that. at the meeting. Yeah. Remember the, there were a few changes they made at the meeting. Are those incorporated? Yes. Yes. Okay. We looked at my notes and your notes. <laughs> we went through yours, Gina did. And then we discussed them and tried to incorporate those changes. Right, we, yeah, we just, uh, we used the, the same board policies we used for the previous to try and save paper. Yes. So we didn't, we just right. needed to double check that those changes were yep. going to be made, that's all. Yep. Anybody else? Any other questions, comments? Are we ready to move approval? I would move approval with the deletion of uh, BP 0500 and BP 
1113. And the other changes? And the other changes discussed at the last meeting. Do I have a second? I will second that. Okay. All those in favor of said motion, I'm not going to repeat it. All, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, board member reports. Yes. Last Saturday, I attended the senior class play at Christopher High School, mm -hmm. uh, Our Town. Very well good production. The, the, the students were just really into it for a senior play. It's just a shame that they have to work in such a small area. I mean, that, that little box is just horrible. They did, did very well for their environment. Good. Except they couldn't find the light switch to turn the lights off yeah. in the hallways. <laughs> you almost got a call. <laughs> <laughs> well, if someone wants to donate about $20 now, million now, because yeah. it used to be $14 million for the new theater, we could fix that. I'll just write you a check. <laughs> Trustee McGirt. Well, I attended that play on Thursday afternoon. And I'd like to give credit to Dr. Kate Booth. She just does a fantastic job with the students. And I found the black box to be just fine for what it was, because you are totally in another place. I, I kind of lost awareness of even who was sitting around me. It was all students. And um, I think the students really need to be commended. I guess she gave them an option. I don't know if she gave this little introduction before they did it. But she kind of threw it out to the students and said, I don't really know if this applies to the world that we're living in now. It's a small town in New Hampshire. And the students decided to do it anyway. And there are so many universal truths in that play that I was really, I mean, things that apply to all of our lives now, too. And I, I think that's commendable that they went ahead and tried it, even though she thought it was a little risky. So I, th I thought it was uh, really a, a worthwhile effort on their part. Uh, did you have a chance to see it, Heather? Yeah. I know you're such a, you, you would have really box. liked it. I Do you too? Yeah, I, I've yeah, I always it was loved fun. the black box. <laughs> yeah, but I think you would have enjoyed this yeah, little production too. Just very good. Production. Very yeah. good. So I'm glad you went. So, yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Trustee Pace. Um, I attended the uh, gate parent committee, let's call it there, um, and uh, Ms. LaRona uh, spearheaded a, a good discussion. She brought in an expert <coughs> uh, via teleconference to talk about some of the issues that are uh, specific to um, what, what gate children go through. Uh, um, it, it was nice hearing an outside expert talk about uh, some of the issues that that parents are facing. So it was a it was a really good meeting. So thank you. Good. Anybody else? Trustee Rosser. Um, I went to a screening of uh, screenagers at Gilray High School, and it um, basically was presented by. Um, the Parents Club, Gilroy High School, and uh, I don't know if anybody here is aware or knows about uh, screenagers mm -hmm. or have, have, have seen it. <coughs> at any rate, uh, it's a movie uh, that was made by uh, a doctor uh, who was dealing with her parent, her kids. Um, um, issues around using technology and kind of abusing technology. And so it became such a big issue that she decided to do uh, a story, a movie about it. And it's been, it, it, it was produced or, or at least came out in 2000, May 2016. And uh, it's been, um, there have been many stories about uh, you know, the significance of, of the sh uh, screenagers, they, it, it could apply to all of us. It's not teenagers by any means. I mean, when I looked at that and I said, I, we see ourselves in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And um, 
but it, it really amazed me in, in sharing the story uh, that, um, you know, and because we see it in our daily lives, how much technology is adversely affecting us. Uh, and, you, you know, we're always concerned about the preoccupation of how much time and how uh, addictive our de devices are, and we're all uh, addressing that. But anyway, this whole this this story is all about that. It tells a very good story. You can you can view it online uh, because it's available online. Um, and uh, it's there's stories by PBS did a, a story on it. Every major network has done stories. If you look it up on the internet, there's a lot a lot of uh, information about, uh, again, trying to uh, make people much more engaged with the issues of technology. And one of the takeaways I got from seeing the film was when they talked about how we've always talked about the importance of bringing more technology into the classroom and into the schools, but the, there was uh, indications or, or that there was some negative impact that was that was actually detrimental to instruction that was happening that we have to be concerned about, and that um, that you know in other words the more technology that people have and they take it home with them that it develops many other issues that that are distracting from you know their being able to study and they used examples of, of kids that were top performing kids went away to universities and uh, they became s such binge um, uh, gamers or whatever that it was like it, exactly like a drug addiction or an alcoholic or whatever to such extreme levels and um, but again, the thing that, that caught my attention was when they said that u utilizing the technology where they take it home and they're using it, that it's much more challenging for young people. I mean, it, adults have problems with it. Mm -hmm. And they don't even recognize it. You know, we don't recognize it, or at least many of us don't. But, um, but kids is a different story because they don't, they just don't have that sense of balance, you know, and they don't have the capability of doing it on their own. So anyway, it's, it's, it raises some great questions. Uh, I highly recommend it, and um, that's, I wanted to share that. Thank you. Um, and I really, it wasn't a big audience that was there the night I went, no, but, right. but it was a dedicated uh, staff uh, that was there and parents and they were very motivated about showing the film and talking about it. Um, what was the other thing? I had one other thing. Uh, I, I know you, Debbie, that you talked about the, um, um, what do you call it, the audit, walk audit Elliot. planned for Elliot. With the, for Elliot. And I know there's, um, the, there's a lot of interest in that I'm picking up. And I was, uh, I attended a meeting of the South County Health uh, Task Force that's chaired by our, uh, Supervisor Wasserman. And uh, they're very interested in part, they would like to be part of it. And, um, and I know that some, some of uh, the, the walk, and bicycle task force people, Chad, he, he came over and spoke to us. They're very interested in participating and I know that the parents group at Elliott also has expressed interest in that too. So there's a lot of interest in, in that, um, that we're doing that, so. Cheryl's, Cheryl's going to coordinate it um, when she returns. We've okay. We talked about it. Oh great, that's pretty much it. Okay, thank you, anybody else? Just briefly, I, I've been attending the Angels Without Borders meetings every month, and they have been doing an amazing job bringing in presenters from different social agencies, including Parents Helping Parents. And um, 
I learn something every single time I go, and they have an outstanding attendance. It's a, a gr they fill that back room. Um, I was just noticing this last time. They thoughtfully provide translators for the English speaking, because these presentations are in Spanish. And so um, I, there were two parents there that were using the uh, the, um, the simultaneous translation service that we similar to what we provide here, but they left halfway through. Um, they're not accustomed to those services as the Spanish-speaking populations tend to be because it's uh, something they have to work with on a regular basis. So it's just kind of brought to my attention um, perhaps uh, the need to kind of reboot that Angels Without Borders or some sort of parent group in English again because it looks like they're starting to develop some interest. And that Spanish group is so strong and dedicated. It's, was, it's a, it was a very impressive uh, presentation last week. So Good. Anybody else? Okay, so our next board meeting is March 8th, and I'm looking at closed session. Do we want to, Trustee Pace, do we want to put the yes, superintendent do. evaluation on that closed session? Yes, we do. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you for putting that together for us. Yes, you. thank you. much easier. Your response from everybody? I did. That's awesome. Yeah, probably me last. I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm last. <but laughs> okay. Well, that is the end you. of this. Do we have any future agenda items? Do we have any future agenda items? Oh, Heather does have one. Thank you. Something perhaps for the for further out. I just wanted an update on the pilot for the administration program for the administration of IEPs. Or just a follow up okay. on how that's going. Sure. That's good. Thank you. Put that on the list. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Hearing nothing else, this meeting is adjourned.